My name is John McCutcheon. I'm an assistant professor in the Division of Biological Sciences at the University of Montana in Missoula. My lab studies insects and their symbiotic microorganisms. In this video abstract for the September 11, 2014 issue of Cell, we'll be discussing cicadas and their endosymbiotic bacteria. Cicadas spend most of their long lives below ground, eating sap from roots using their piercing, sucking mouth parts. Their lifespans range from 2 to 17 years, during which time they pass through five juvenile stages called nymphs. When the nymphs are mature, they emerge from the ground. The males sing for mates, sometimes quite loudly. If successful, and who could resist that call, they mate, the female lays eggs, and the adults die shortly after. Nymphs emerge from the eggs, fall to the ground, dig down to a root, and start the process over again. But what really fascinates us about cicadas are the bacterial endosymbionts that make all of this possible. Cicadas, like nearly all other sap-feeding insects, house bacteria in specialized cells that are passed down through the generations of the female's eggs. These bacteria, named Sulcia and Hodgkinia in cicadas, provide important nutrients, in particular essential amino acids, that the animal cannot obtain from their restricted xylem sap diet or make on their own. In 2009, in collaboration with my postdoc advisor, Nancy Moran, I sequenced the Hodgkinia genome from Diceroprocta semisyncta and found that it was really, really strange. Among other things, it was very small, encoded few genes, and had a non-standard genetic code. This is what we knew about Hodgkinia when James Van Leuven joined my lab in 2010. My name is James Van Leuven. I'm a student in the Cellular, Molecular, and Microbial Biology graduate program at the University of Montana. When I joined John's lab, I started a project involved in sequencing Sulcia and Hodgkinia from a variety of cicada species. When I looked at the data for Hodgkinia from the Chilean cicada species Tetagates undata, I noticed something very strange going on. There seemed to be sections of the Hodgkinia genome that were duplicated but not exactly so. Some genes were shared between both genome copies, but other regions of the genomes were not identical. For example, a gene homolog present in one chromosome was not functional in the other, or in some cases entirely deleted. It seemed that there were two versions of the Hodgkinia genome in the data. When I told this to John, I got the sense that he didn't believe me. I did not believe him. But upon closing the Hodgkinia genome into two complete circular mapping chromosomes, the pattern became clear. There were definitely two distinct chromosomes, and if one chromosome had lost a certain gene, it was always retained in the other. Together, all the genes present on the 2009 single genome version of Hodgkinia were on one or the other chromosome. We did more experiments and found that Hodgkinia from a closely related cicada in the same genus also had a highly reduced genome, which was important because it suggested that the ancestor of the duplicated version of the Hodgkinia genome was itself already very tiny. I need to mention that none of this would be possible without our collaborator Chris Simon, professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Connecticut in Storrs, and her graduate student Russ Meister. It's not like we just ran out and collected a bunch of cicadas in the genus Tetagates, which, as James mentioned, happened to live in Chile. It took years of work and the expertise of Chris and Russ to get this done. So, the question at this point was how are these duplicated chromosomes organized in Hodgkinian cells? Is the duplicated structure the result of something like a whole genome duplication, which would give rise to two distinct chromosomes in the same Hodgkinia cell? Or are these two chromosomes located in different Hodgkinia cells, and thus the result of something more akin to a speciation event? I was able to visualize the chromosomes by fluorescence microscopy, and the results were clear. Here, scrolling through a confocal Z stack, I've stained the insect nuclei in magenta, Sulcia cells in green, and the two Hodgkinia cell types in yellow and blue. These data show that Hodgkinia is structured with cytologically distinct genomes partitioned into discrete cells. This meant that Tetagates undata had three bacterial endosymbionts, not two. In other words, a three-way symbiosis became a four-way symbiosis through an unusual symbiont speciation event. While this is amazing and unusual on its own, what really fascinated us was that this didn't seem to have any functional impact on the symbiosis. The same genes are still there, 
They're just partitioned onto two Hodgkinia genomes that are complementary, yet reside in discrete cells. So, why did this happen? It's not clear at this point, but we favor the idea that this is an example of non-adaptive evolution. It's not better to have two Hodgkinia genomes performing the same function as one, but it happened, and now the entire symbiosis must deal with it. It's an increase in complexity not driven by the pressure to become ever more refined, but because sometimes increased complexity is inevitable in biological systems.